Oh, well, happy Sunday, my friends. How are y'all? Jeff, I hope the levels are good. Let's see who's here. Richard is here. Valentine, David, Mark, Adam, Taylor. Hello, my friend. And Renee. All my favorite people are here. Happy Sunday, everybody. Here we go. Oh, Renee says she's got fresh powder. I'm assuming she means snow. Uh, we've had uh, the same snow here for a very long time. It's like we're, uh, it's like Ice Station Zebra outside, you know? Like, well, you, you go out once a week to kind of like resupply and, and bury your dead. And then, uh, you know, just kind of hunker down for the next, next seven days. Uh, welcome to Logic Live. This is going to be an amazing show. This is episode 73 with our friend Rufus Blackwell and the art of the seamless transition. I cannot wait to, for Rufus to take you through all this. Hello, Yola. Hey, Sean. Here we go again, man. Uh, I hope Randy joins in because I've got something very, very, very special planned for him this morning uh, or this afternoon, I guess, but that's also a relative term. Maury, how are you, man? Wonderful. All right. I remember uh, seeing, well, you know what? It's, it's the term seamless transition. It kind of makes everyone go, uh, oh my God, that was amazing. And then you cringe inside because you know what's involved. Any flame artist knows what's involved. You guys are going to love this. All right, speaking of a seamless transition, everybody. There you go, huh? It's called Edge Rays. I think I'm going to have to pay Brian Fox for that one. Hey, everybody. My name is Andy. Welcome to Logic Live. And it's a pleasure to see all of you and happy Sunday to everyone. Let's get this party started. This is Logic Live number 73. And our friend Rufus Blackwell will be, will be on in a minute to take us through uh, some amazing seamless transitions he did for a spot. But first, this episode of Logic Live is brought to you by, as well as this cursor, is brought to you by our friends at Cynesis.io. Solutions, development, integration, and support. Supporting Flame Artists since 1997. Thank you very much for supporting Logic Cynesis. And thank you to our friends at AJA. AJA and Flame together since 2006. They make the best video hardware in the business. Anybody need tech support out there? Call Jack. Jack Horrocks at jack at flametech.com.au. He is your source for any troubles you're having. Uh, for flame networking storage or custom builds if you want to if you're having trouble if you want to build out a new machine if you want to uh, Upgrade what you have give Jack a call. Thank you very much Jack for being a sponsor of logic live and If anyone needs uh, to save if anyone is in the market for some Boris effects plugins Make sure you use the logic.tv discount code and save yourself 15% on any Boris effect product standalone or subscription when you use the code logic-15 at checkout Speaking of checking out, check out the Logic merch store when you have a chance, ladies and gentlemen, at logic.tv. Just click the merch link. Uh, I'm very happy to announce we have a new item. It is a zip-up hoodie uh, with Logic TV logos emblazoned on the front and the back. Uh, look your best, whether you're rotoing, comping, or uh, like me this week, cursing out the new machine that you bought because you, um, you, you, you can't figure out how to build a Linux machine. But I, 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 I actually have figured it out thanks to the help of my friends. We also have, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, a whole array of Logic hats. The winter hats are flying off the shelves, uh, as though we have shelves. Um, and we also have an assortment of baseball hats available in white and black. If you'd like to pick any of those up, logic.tv, and click the merch link. All right, want to give a shout out to our friends on Patreon. Thank you so much to our patrons. The list keeps growing. It's amazing. We're up to 113 patrons supporting what we're doing here at Logic.tv. We could not do what we do without you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. If you'd like to support what we're doing here at Logic for as little as $5 a month and get yourself some merch, some discounts, and access to exclusive content like the Q&As that we do with our, our uh, guests after the show, just head on over to patreon.com slash logictv and become a patron. And speaking of the forum, let me give you some updated statistics on the forum here. We had a banner week uh, this year on the forum. Randy and I were going over the, uh, the, the usage reports uh, yesterday, and I think it was the announcement of uh, M1 support, uh, or lack thereof, that um, caused a huge spike in traffic this week, or maybe everybody was just back from holiday, or maybe everybody was stuck inside because of the snow. I don't know, but we're up to 1,027 users. We've had 1.6 million page views since we started the forum. 
over 18,000 posts, and we're up to 269 users on Discord. If you haven't signed up for the Discord channel, please do join the conversation. I was on the other day. Uh, I was working on something that was not NDA, so I just shared my screen and it just worked away. And I think we had like seven people who joined in, and we were just kind of chatting and catching up, and then, you know, obviously talking flame because that's what was going on. Just click the Discord link at forum.logic.tv to join the fun. Also want to uh, plug our Logic Academy classes. We, we uh, released three classes uh, at the end of last year. The first was a two-parter from our friend Jeff Kyle on the image node. Uh, the first part is an overview of the image node and the image node workflow. Part two, uh, Jeff goes into some specific workflows for beauty work, for color grading, and then some extra tips. If, you, if you've seen uh, Jeff's Connected Conform Logic Academy class, he does a really good job at pointing out the, uh, the roadblocks or the, the, the things that might trip you up along the way as you're learning a new workflow, definitely check that out. And then we have two videos from our friend Randy McEntee. The first is Eight Minute Aces. Color management is scary, ladies and gentlemen. It always is and it always will be, but Randy made it simple. In eight minutes, you too will be an ace of aces. Thank you very much. I just made that up off the top of my head. Uh, and then Randy also did a video on NDI. NDI is a way to stream the output of your computer to wherever in the world you want. And we're all doing that now. So uh, what Randy, Randy did a great job. Again, I'm pointing out the pitfalls. Sometimes when you're doing this streaming, you have audio issues that you need to overcome. Um, and he goes through that. He also goes through how to stream to, uh, to iOS apps and uh, Apple TVs and other devices that you have. Definitely check those out. That's the image node, eight minute aces, intro to NDI. Uh, and that joins the uh, connected conform one that I mentioned before. They're now available at logic.tv. They are free. I want to thank Autodesk for sponsoring Logic Academy. We have uh, a few more in production right now, and hopefully we'll get those to you soon on Logic TV. Speaking of learning, I just want to give another shout out to all the great work that our friend Grant K is doing over on the Flame Learning Channel. Grant has been working overtime on a Flame Fundamentals course. So if you know anyone who's trying to learn Flame uh, for the first time, definitely have them check out what Grant is doing. Thank you so much, Grant. All right. I saw, I guess Rufus posted the, uh, a, a link to this spot that he had worked on on the forum last year, and it was just mind-blowing. It was just some of the greatest seamless trans transitions I've ever seen. And like I said at the top of the show, having done a number of these myself, you look at them and at like first you go like, oh my God, how did you do that? And then I saw his shot breakdown and like I, you know, I started to have like PTSD because we've all, anyone who's had to deal with crazy uh, seamless transitions knows how much work goes into them. And I'm so excited that Rufus has agreed to come on today and take us through the spot. Um, thanks everybody for, for logging in early. Rufus is coming to us from uh, Vietnam. And so I'm going to bring him on right now. Hello, my friend. How are you? Hello. Yeah, I'm doing really good. Great to be here. Excellent. Hello from Vietnam. Uh, just a, a heads up Could to everybody. We have been having we have been having some internet issues, so if we do drop out, uh, Rufus will just come right back in. Um, so, Rufus, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then about the spot, and then we'll dive in. Pun intended, because it's a seamless transition spot. Cool. Okay. So, um, <laughs> um, cool. Yeah. So, I'm. I was a. Uh, you know, I, I was trained up in London did a lot of time in London um, back in the day. You know day. what, Rufus, I'm sorry uh, to stop you so quick. At but, Rush's post-production. Um, we're having a little bit of audio issue with you. Why don't you disconnect and then come back, and we'll try one more time. Okay, cool. Stand by, everybody. You know, while we're waiting for Rufus to come back, I'm going to show you the spot. Here it comes. When it comes to venturing into unfamiliar markets, at Standard Chartered, we understand the journey you're making. We've got the local expertise and innovative vision to meet all of your company's needs. To make the connections, to uncover the ideas and insights that matter 
in a complex and fast-moving world. Our passion is guiding businesses into the world's fastest growing markets. Our network of experts are already there. Seeking out opportunities at every turn. Helping businesses and people prosper. Promoting dialogue driving innovation, and building the sustainable economies of the future. Because your success is our business. And opening doors is what we do. We are Standard Chartered. Here for good. Right? I mean, come on. Incredible. Incredible, <laughs> incredible work. All right, welcome back, Rufus. Cool. Okay, can you hear me now? You Can you hear me? Okay? Yes, sir. Yep, all good. Cool. Yeah, so tell okay, us a yeah, bit so, about um, I'm a London flame artist. I've, I've done, you know, sort of uh, eight years in London, I guess, um, and then worked all over the place. I've done a bit of work in Malaysia, done a bit of work in... Um, uh, in Indonesia, and I normally travel all around Southeast Asia um, doing various different jobs, apart from obviously not at the moment for obvious reasons. Um, and I've always shot stuff on the side. I, I was always interested in time lapse photography. And off the back of that, I got commissioned by DJI to do a load of time lapse photography with their gimbals and with their drones. And so I sort of got a weird specialism. Yeah, so they asked me to do these aerial hyperlapse. Um, to sort of, I, I guess, kind of pioneer the aerial hyperlapse um, stuff with DJI drones. So I did that. I did a load of promotional videos for them. It's really cool. So that's mean, you know, drone work and special effects work. What's interesting about that, in very much the same way that you would camera in action, you have like motion path animation for the camera movement. And then you also have point of interest. So you can see there, the point of interest is on the beach. So the camera is always looking at that point of interest, just the way you'd set it up in flame. So it's quite interesting to go out into the real world and set up those same kind of camera moves. Um, you know, you can set up like perfect camera moves and, and, and then just hit go and it does it. And, and not only that, it'll do it again and again and again. So you can do it uh, in daytime and nighttime and do seamless transitions from day to night. Um, so there's lots of really interesting stuff that you can do with with um, drones and visual effects. They're two quite complementary skills. So um, <clears throat> yeah, so I've been doing that for you know for as long as drones have been around really, um, and have got a bit known I guess as being a sort of drone specialist in the VFX world. So that's why this one ended up falling in my lap. Um, and it's just a really yeah, it's just I mean as soon as they you know told me what the pitch was you know. Dry, uh, flying drones through all 10 different amazing landscapes and putting CG doors into it, you know, it's just like, yeah, definitely brilliant. <laughs> That's right up your alley. Right? Job. Yeah, perfect. Um, so the job, so it was all shot on little FPV drones, which are tiny little drones. Um, it was all shot on GoPro, which is pretty amazing. You know, it's like, oh. that's quite a big leap of faith. Yep. for the client and the uh, production company and the agency and everything like that because obviously you know with all those locations quite a, you know reason, big budget thing and they uh to go right we're going to do it all on gopro <laughs> um but I, I was sort of quite happy with how much i managed to squeeze out the gopro images so i'll go through a bit of how to do that um so um uh yeah, so first of all, oh, we lost him. We've been having an internet day. And Greg Paul Malone, I have a feeling you're doing a lot of downloading right now. And so that's kind of blocking the signal between New York and Vietnam. So if you wouldn't mind uh, just pushing pause on downloading, you know, backing up the internet to your house, uh, I'd appreciate that. All right, let's see. Rufus is back. Can you hear me? Welcome okay? back. Sorry about that. That's okay. okay. Cool. I'll try and keep it as concise as possible. 
get as much information in, in as possible. So first of all, um, yeah, so the director, Anthony, was an FPV pilot himself. So he really knew what he was doing. And he's done lots of really good videos, but um, <clears throat> but he, he wasn't used to, to comping photorealistic CG, which is why they got a flame artist in. And also the drawing of the world needed, you know, that sort of flame skill set. Mm -hmm. So, um, but he, so first of all, you, you shoot on the GoPros really wide. So it's a 4-3 image, and then you stabilize it using Real Steady, which is the GoPro specific stabilizer. So Anthony said what we would be doing, like everything on this job is non-standard, basically. What Anthony said is that what we would be doing is um, shooting, is shooting it, stabilizing it, and then tracking the stabilized images and putting the doors into the stabilized images. And I was thinking, well, that's definitely not going to be happening because there's no way we're going to be, you know, camera tracking stabilized images yeah, because no, they, it wouldn't be able to get a proper, it wouldn't be able to resolve the camera track. Yeah. Um, and, and the stabilized images, the real steady really warps the image around, you know, it, to, and it, it does an amazing job of stabilizing it, but it um, really warps it around, really pulls the image around. So that's going to really screw up your camera track because it's not going to be able to get, not going to understand the lens information, not be able to understand the distortion, not be able to do any of that. But then, interestingly, I went away and did some tests and the CG team, Fifth Wall VFX, went and did some tests and we all came back onto a zoom meeting and we all said right okay we're going to be working on the stabilized images <laughs> because <clears throat> because the the image jumped around so much on the unstabilized images that it was mm -hmm. it would be impossible to work with it because you just couldn't see what you were working on whereas actually synthize in particular which is the camera tracker that i use was able to really do a good job of just like figuring out what was going on I, I i was telling the camera tracker that it was a zoom lens even though obviously it was fixed because the stabilizer is sort of pushing in and pulling out and that seemed to make it work basically um so yeah we did all the comping on um on the stabilized images um and you can see that right in your it, in your um in your vfx breakdown that you posted like all the there are a bunch of synthized um, bits of geometry here, right? That's where all this comes from, correct? Yeah. So that's a really cool little tool within Synthize where you can create a topographical mesh. So in the same as, you know, the old school tracker, camera tracker in Flame, you have all of the tracking points. In Synthize, you have that, although more of them and you can tell it to create topographical mesh from all of those tracking markers it can be really useful for you know cleaning up em uh, elements and then reprojecting it back onto a topographical landscape mm -hmm. uh, i don't use it that often but when you do it's an absolute godsend for when you're having to track hillsides and you know anything that's not flat it can be really useful to to do that yeah i use that in synthesize a lot very cool. um very cool yeah so then um yeah so then the next stage is to take it to video enhancer ai which is another tool outside of flame that i just absolutely love at the moment which um just removes all, you know because it's all coming in it's basically h264 it's mm -hmm. been stabilized so you're pushing into it even more um and you yeah you get these images like the image on the left here you know it's just gopro's great for what it is but it's not perfect and you can just regenerate all of that detail um like the image on the right hand side with video enhancer ai i mean it's incredible and wow. it's not it, it doesn't give you any buzzing it doesn't give you any boiling it doesn't give you it's 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 stable frame to frame because it's specifically for video it's not just doing stills Mm -hmm. um, so everything just immediately goes through Video Enhancer AI. It gets cleaned up that way, and you just end up with much nicer images on the other side of it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that means that you're then ready to start. And, and, and also, I mean, sometimes I even camera track the Video Enhancer AI because, you know, ultimately your compression in um, your GoPro compression is going to screw up your camera track. And if you can remove that compression before you take it to the camera tracker, I mean, I haven't really done empirical tests with it, but mm -hmm. it seems like it would work better that way. So I, of I often do that. 
Yeah, um, Mor Maury in the chat was just asking. So the 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 workflow you did for this was you did uh, you captured the footage, then you stabilized it, then you put it through Video Enhancer AI. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. I didn't stabilize it actually. It came to us stabilized from the drone guys because oh, they were right, the ones. right, right. They they Using they the, do uh, that. So yeah, the GoPro. So app. so we just got sent the stabilized stuff, which comes in at a weird resolution of like two point seven K which is the resolution that we end up doing the whole project at because um, because the CG team had to start working on it before I was free. So they were just taking the sections that they wanted to work on because they knew the tape. They took the sections that they wanted to work on, chopped it up. They would usually just do like maybe the last 500 frames and then I would take the last good frame from there and track it back. Um, gotcha. because. Yeah, because there's a lot of rendering for CG to do, basically. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, then CG was just like normal CG. You know, they would give me all the different passes. This is called a clay pass, I found out on this job, um, which I wasn't using, but it's just a very nice visual representation. Wow, never heard of that one. Um, no, yeah, uh, clay pass. So, um yeah, so they were giving me, that was just normal CG comping, which all took place in ACES. So we were bouncing around between color spaces. Like they were giving it to me in the normal linear CG stuff. I would take it into ACES. All of the source footage was coming in log and Rec 709. And I was changing that, you know, like GoPro, ProTune log. I was all changing yeah. all of that. Add, add a weird resolution comping. and you've got basically, you know, every post visual effects job in the world right now <laughs> yeah, exactly right and not only that i was just bouncing backwards and forwards between different colors places as as we'll see as we go as through one the job. does yeah um so then i guess the next thing then was to join the worlds right so you've got all of these different drone camera moves um where you need to jo join the worlds maybe i mm -hmm. should go into my screen now uh, Let's do um so um, are you looking at my screen? Yep. So, so something like this was quite easy because you're going from a from you know close quarters to a wide. You can't really see what's going on with the wide. So mm -hmm. stuff like that, you just had to match the sort of pitch and roll and stuff like that. You could almost do that by eye. Um, then some of them I was trying to do like I mean immediately I just tried like one you know two point track or one point track and stabilize one and track it into the other and that works to some extent. <clears throat> then in the breakdown, I showed this technique here, which is um, you create the geometry of the scene that you're leaving and you project the scene that you're going on into onto that scene. Um, and that that works. You know, that was I, I did some successful tests with that. That works. And I used that in the VFX breakdown because visually you can see it. Well, you can see what's going on. Um, but it's not the actual, it's not the actual technique that I used in the end. Mm -hmm. Um, I used a better technique, but it doesn't, it, you couldn't really show it because it's motion vectors. You couldn't show it in the demo because it just, you know, a, a <laughs> no, people just wouldn't really get what was going on. Right. Yeah. So, it doesn't have that, um, that instant payoff of just orbiting the camera around. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit more, um, internal than that. So, uh, yeah. So what I use to join the worlds, I'll try and explain it as concisely as possible, is um, so in this part of the batch here, sorry, it's a bit messy. In this part of the batch here, you've got the scene that we're leaving, India. And in this part of the batch here, we've got the scene that we're going into, um, which is Bali. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, and in here, we've got motion vectors, right? Um, so what I did is basically you've got to you've got to do a, a clean handoff between the action of India and the action of Bali. So I took the action of India, which is this here, and as we're going along, I slow I, I slowed it down as we were going through here using time remapping. So it just slows down like that, and then in the Bali section, it, it's hardly moving at all to begin with. And then it speeds up as we go through. And so here, in here, you've got the barley, which is hardly moving at the beginning and then speeding up. And then you've got the India, which is 
sped up to begin with and then slowing down. And so if you look at the motion vectored output, you've got you've got actually let me show you on this one here because it's more extreme it's um, really an amazing uh use of of motion vectors like i when i think about all the times i've had to do a seamless transition it there's always like you said there's some uh a, a manipulation you have to do to both sides to get the transition to be smoother maybe it's timing mapping maybe yeah. it's scaling maybe it's a little uh, xy like a two-dimensional uh transformation yeah. but i never thought about using motion vectors and it's brilliant because yeah. Now you're, you you get perspective. You can you can kind of uh, you know push things into the the third and, and I guess even the fourth dimension if you have to. Yeah. So so here you can see at the end we've got the actual barley movement, right? And hit, and then it slowly takes further backwards. You can see that at this point here, this is India driving the movement. So in the 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 motion of the India clip is mm -hmm. causing that. And you can see. So if you take so I, I made an example here actually where the doors stay open for longer <clears throat> oh I, yeah, I have that let me to show that uh, let me show that full screen here right. It'll be can, you, can you see it here okay or not or, i'll play yeah, it i'll play, play it, it um i'll play it locally it'll it'll, it'll uh okay cool it'll be smoother be cleaner oh yeah wow oh totally yep when you go through the as uh, you get that kind of um you can see the perspective match and everything when you fly through, yeah, which is always the exactly. hardest and thing to try to fake in 2D. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so at that point here, once you're back here, right, basically that, that barley scene is completely pinned to the India scene behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so any, any tilt, any weave, any uh, roll, you know, all of it... Um, is driven by the India scene. It just it just really helped. And then those two little time warps sort of hopefully seamlessly hand off from one to the next. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, there's hmm. a question for you here uh, from Richard, who's wondering, how do you transition from one motion vector to the other? So it's not one, it's, it's only one motion vector. It's, it's the transition is between the time remaps. So you've got one time remap slowing here. So just as in, just, so this is, this is the one that's driving the motion vectors and that slows down just towards the end here. And at the same uh. time as that's slowing down, Bali is just speeding up. So Bali here is hardly moving. And just as the India is stopping driving the motion vectors, Bali is speeding up. And then on the other side of that, the motion vectors aren't having any effect. Yep. So, That's so over great. about 15 frames, yeah, you just, it, it, the motion is handed off from India to Bali. Um, yeah. Like that. That's great, man. Uh, yeah, Sean from the chat is saying amazing solve and never would have thought of that. That's great. It's it's you're, yeah, well, you're using yeah, motion vectors I mean, the same way that like uh, I know <laughs> I've used um, a, a motion blur and you know yeah. dissolves and whatever to help smooth that transition. But this way, yeah, does but it just you, you say you wouldn't have thought of that, but you probably would have done if you'd had to do this job. You know, because I didn't think you know I didn't I didn't get this job and think oh yeah that's how I'm going to do it. You know, uh -huh. I've got this job. So one thing that was really nice about this job is we actually had time on it. You know, it wasn't we had like we had probably two probably more than two months from when it landed in my lap until i had to deliver it because they had to organize all these drone crews in 10 different locations and stuff like that so and and not only that but and the director was able to give me test files really early on you know mm -hmm. he, he basically already had them it, you know so um so so i was able to just sit here and you know you do it and then you sleep on it and you And, and yeah, and then you sort of try different techniques. I probably tried like six different techniques. Oh, Greg Paul, we lost him again. All right. Well, until we get, uh, until we get our friend uh, Rufus back, I'm going to give away a piece. Oh, never mind. Hold that thought. Here comes Rufus. All right. Welcome back. Sorry about that. Uh, cool. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, 
it took quite a long time to come up with that. And to begin with, I, was just, I couldn't get my head around it. And it was really complicated. But once you start doing one after another, it, you, you understand the technique better. And then, and, then, and then you can just knock them out. Yeah. By the end, I was knocking them out quite quickly. Um, That's yeah, great. So, it's really cool. Great, great, great. Do you want me to carry on? Yeah. Um, so that was, yeah. So then basically then you have to create one seamless um one seamless timeline oh I've gone into the time warp by mistake you have to create one seamless timeline of all your different transitions so so like this second half is dubai to india to bali to singapore to london um and you just create that as one timeline and then after that it has to go through time remapping in the timeline um most of that was comped in aces but then all the time remapping has to take place in rec 709 because uh sorry uh, so we sorry. know why <laughs> <clears throat> yeah because so all the time remapping had to take place in rec 709 because time remapping just works so much better in rec 709. um then uh yeah, so you have to you have to basically go through and set the time remapping. Well, I had an offline to match, but obviously you tidy up the time remapping from what they've done in the offline. Um, that all goes with motion. I always set everything to have a hundred and eighty degree shutter, so shutter at point five. Um, it says samples ten, but that's just because we're looking at the base layer. Normally, it'd be twenty five sam samples. Um, But then, uh, okay. Then the problem that you, the problem that I encountered at that point is that um, as you go through the doors, you get smearing between the different worlds. So you can see the door here is interacting with the world behind it. Um, especially oh, yeah, here sure. you can see that whole thing there yeah so that's because the door is moving too fast over the background they just can't figure it out um and so had to create this really complex system of doing it all in the timeline so rather than in here i had one night so you got the batch effects in the batch effects you've got this timeline which is all of your different sequences one to the next boom boom ungraded boom 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 um that's how i would have liked to have done it but um i couldn't do that because of that smearing thing so i had to create this system um whereby each layer was so, so you set the time we map and, and once you've done that, there's no changing that because then you have to break it all up into different sections. So Singapore, Bali, um, India, so that, so I had to, in my batch effects, I had to export it with a mat. Um, and yeah. And then, so, so then the time remapping is only happening on a pre-multiplied front. It's hard to show it, but, um, yeah, this is a, Pre, so it's time remapping on the pre-multiplied front. And so you haven't got barley in there getting smeared in there. Um, you can't show how the time remapping works because it's happening in um, in there with in the, the map. In, in the timeline, it, yeah. Yeah, in the timeline. But it basically fixed that problem. Um, so if, if, then if I, get the smearing between the if two. I understand you correctly, you had all your different comps. Uh, you then needed to do time remapping on them because that always has to happen yeah uh, i had to export that is, so for every yeah. single comp I had to do a, a really annoying system yeah i had to yep. export the front um the front and the mat here mm -hmm. um for for india and then i had to export barley in the background so you've then got this barley that's in the background and then that's what's in this time layer so in this timeline here you have that barley which is the background there mm -hmm. and then it has to do a sort of switch over which is this little thing here um to the barley that's pre-multiplied 
with the mat, which then goes into Singapore. So it's just yeah. a really it's a real annoying way of working. And so the trick, <clears throat> the trick that I had to do for that was work with write files, which I don't use that much, but are actually brilliant. And especially in this situation, because I normally use render files and I'd be rendering out and then I'd have to, you'd have to render out, you'd have to go into here you'd have to go into your timeline you'd have to drop it into the timeline it's just an absolute nightmare because every mm -hmm. time you'd have to work out what clip goes where so the the advantage of using write files is that you could just write it out you only had to figure it out once and then you could keep rendering it and then if you wanted to see what it looked like in the timeline so say i rendered bali all i have to do then is just click on that, go media, flush renders, and then you'd immediately, your your new written files would come through your little setup in Bali and um, and and it would feed out and you'd be able to view it in the timeline. It was just, that was really helpful. Um, yeah, that was really good. That's crazy. So then, it's, it's really, it yeah. really, like, yeah, it's it, the, in the chat here, people are praising your, your use of uh, the timeline for this and of write files for this. It's like, <laughs> I, I, you know, again, anyone who's done seamless transitions like this knows like you figure it out and then all of a sudden you got to change the timing on it after you figured it out and that just destroys yeah. it. And now you got to clean yeah. that up and now you've created this loop because every time something has to change, you, you, it, you know, it's 15 steps that only you understand and you better hope you don't call yeah. in sick or die because no one else will ever be <laughs> pick it up, yeah. right? Exactly. And so that's what I was like, thinking. I was, <laughs> it, it would be the worst project to hand over to someone else, you know. Completely. If, if you were working, you know, in a facility or something, and you got COVID and you had to hand it over, it's the sort of <laughs> the sort of job that if if you were the person taking it over, your heart would just sink. You know, were, were you the only like, uh, flame artist working on this? Yeah. Yeah, wow. it was a labor of wow. love. <laughs> um, Amazing. I, I, I fed some stuff out to, you know, clean up and rotor and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But yeah, basically, because you couldn't, there wasn't much, there wasn't really any way that you could feed it out. Um, yeah. 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 Wild. Cool. So then, um, then I had to grade. So I graded this as well. I grade quite a few of the spots now, which I really enjoy doing. So the grade I did in here, um, you can see all the grades here. So that's where I graded them. I was grading each, you know, it's quite an easy one to grade because it's not like you have to be consistent shot from shot. You know, the whole point of them is that each one's completely different. So you just have to make each one look nice. So I graded them all in the timeline. I actually quite like grading in aces because for, for sort of photographic stuff like this, it's sorry, in aces CG in linear, because the light moves around in the way it would if you were putting ND filters over a camera and stuff like that. I know you're supposed to grade in aces CCT, and that's probably better for more refined work. But here, I just like the way that the light works like it does in reality. Um, but then I'd also use I have a really massive collection of creative LUTs that obviously are a bit of a cheat, but I quite like. So like the LUT for Bali, you know, this is why I like LUTs. Just that, that's what I had, like horrible browns, yellowy greens, and it just goes like that. Nice. Just, oh, brilliant. Sold. Um, uh, Ruf Rufus, there's a question so, in the chat here, but what, what were you using for grading? So you said the, the LUTs, but then are you using image node, color corrector? Every, yeah, image node. Uh, no, actually, I should be more on it with the image node. I use the master grade node. I use a color corrector and the color warper. And I do some things in, in um, ACES CG, some stuff in, and some stuff in Rec 709. Like sometimes if I just want to add gamma, I just do it in Rec 709 because I know what's going to happen, basically. <laughs> you, know where you, you know where you stand with Rec 709, right? Right. And gamma. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I love color warper. Um, do a lot in that. Uh, um, I mean, it's annoying that Color Warp doesn't really work with Aces that uh, with Aces CG that well because I do still love it and yeah, it just works. But I've sort of been moving more onto the Master Grade node as well, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as the LUTs, yeah, but go, this one's um, easy. Our, I mean, our, our friend Richard Betts says there's no such thing as a cheat. So uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. exactly. You did fine. I agree. Yeah. 100%. Um, and also what I like about the LUTs is that 
it just gives you a way of quickly going through because with something like India, right, there's so many amazing colors going on in there. It's hard to just look, pinging through loads of LUTs. Um, you can you can sort of uh, I'll show you how I grade actually. So this is a grading example. Um, so <clears throat> I set up a little I have a setup like this, right? This is a, just one that I keep in my user bin, my very extensive user bin. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> so uh I have a, this little setup here. It's this isn't the best example because all the images are quite similar, but I'll go through, I'll pick nine key images, right? So you freeze on frame one oh one, one, two, three, one, two, one, five, you know, all of these different images. And it and so you choose the nine key images that you like, right? Um, you know, freeze that frame, whatever, and then and you just and then two up um, here, you can just very look at your output very quickly, just go through and see what each LUT looks like with nine different um, key images, and you can just you know, ah, oh, so it's gorgeous. Three that I'm, yeah, so it's, it's really help. I know for me that's just yeah a really good way of totally. um, doing it, and so. I have these, you know, that have like three different groups of LUTs. Um, these are just, I don't know, one of my groups of LUTs. These are all the ones from ARI, which you can get from the ARI website, which 100% are worth, are worth getting. They're free. They, they're just a load of creative LUTs from ARI that are just absolutely brilliant. Uh, loads of really good LUTs in there. So, yeah, that's what I do. You know, for each one of these, I just went through, went through all my LUTs. Uh, and just chose, chose, you know, so these are my first bunch of selects and then these are my final selects. Yeah, really nice way of working. Very cool. Um, but yeah, so then the problem was that all the, all the color grading took place in the timeline, but that didn't work because as you went through the doors from one to the next, um, uh, if, if you're a colorist, you would have had to have done like a power window around there, but that would have been annoying. But I was doing it myself, so I could actually go in. So it meant that I had to color grade in the, um, you know, in, in, in the timeline, in the batch effects. So um, for something like Bali, actually, let me choose a more complicated one. Yeah, so, well, anyway, so you've got... Your original image coming through here, it has to be so linear. So all defocus has to take place in linear. So you got so it's ACES CG here. You're pre-multiplying it. Uh, let me get to the end. Pre-multiplying it here. It's then going through a defocus here. So just each time as it goes through the door, I just did a little defocus, probably more than you would get photographically, but I just you know wanted to sort of emphasize it. So that's defocusing in ACES CG. It's then unpremultiplied here, taken from um, ACES CG into Rec 709, color graded in Rec 709. So that's the LUT, I guess, I chose for this one. I know that's. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so it went into Rec 709. Then the creative LUT, which is this one, I like the yellows and the blues, sort of complementary colors, work well for Singapore. Um, <clears throat> then it went back to ACES CG. So, I did the color grading in ACES CG, a little, just a bit of graduated. Um, graduated nd what am i doing there pushing up that foreground gamma down in the sky yeah that's pretty standard normally like gain up in the foreground gamma down in the sky usually do that uh, then it had to go back to rec 709 then it had to be re pre-multiplied <laughs> So that it could then go through the time <laughs> warp in a pre-multiplied state in Rec 709. Yeah, there you go. Oh Boom. my god. <laughs> um, oh yeah. So then it's like you had next... two months to work on yeah, this, but yeah, if you didn't have to jump yeah, through all these hoops, this would have taken a weekend. Is that basically what you're um, saying? So... <laughs> yeah, 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 nailed it. No time. Um, then the other thing that I always like to do with these type of jobs, right, is that. The problem with drone, the problem with drone shots is that they're always um, in for everything's in focus the whole time. You know, if you were, if you're doing a normal spot, 
the DOP is going to get nice depth of field in there and, you know, you're going to have a lot of stuff that's nice. So I always like to add some, not depth of field, but graduated defocus around the edges just to um, give it a bit of, well, you can use it to use it to concentrate the eye on whatever you want to concentrate on and it just tends to soften up the edges a bit um so like you can see here there's a lot of graduated defocus going on there so what am i doing here um oh yeah so vignette who don't love a little bit of vignette because yeah just because it's good to have a little bit of vignette mm -hmm. um and then this is, I often like this sort of look for graduated defocus. So you just do a nice diagonal like that, bring the gamma down, blur it a bit, and then use that. So there's another, yeah. So I was, I was also bringing the gamma down in uh, areas that's graduated defocusing, but then this crop DOF is the one that I like most. Um, this does a really nice graduated defocus. Again, it has to be in linear. Um, Rufus, in could you just make the image a little bigger? So, Sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's really bad of me. Uh, yeah, so there you go. You can see there. I just love, yeah, linear defocus. Nice. So let's pull up that image. So um, this is for the nighttime drone stuff I do. You can just see all of these defocuses here. You know, defocus in linear just looks so much nicer. Boom, it really works. Um, cool. Cool. And yeah, that's uh, it basically. A couple of questions in from the chat. Uh, Sean was wondering, there's a vertigo effect on certain sequences. I assume that's like the, the zooming out while the uh, camera's flying forward or something like that. Um, how were the changes in lensing done? Did, was any of that in yeah. post or, or anything in post or it was yeah so um probably the biggest example of that is in singapore so you can see as you come out through there um so that was a mixture of that was a mixture of um yeah the 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 stabilization does that a bit right it really warps the image around um wow <clears throat> I actually have a uh, sample so you, of so that. You, you, you sent me a couple yeah. of stills of that that I can show. Yeah. Sure. Um, here. So, so yeah, this is this image really... here, like before stabilization. And then after, you can see how much uh, mm. of the lensing was changed. Yeah. So that definitely has an effect on it. And then also with the Singapore one, I think they wanted to concentrate on um, the ironing board building um which is this one here uh so yeah they wanted to zoom in at the beginning of it so i had to zoom in there and then yeah pull out so that yeah that exactly that creates that kind of contra zoom effect as you go through it it's actually and, more uh, visible on on the vfx breakdown oh let's see well as you go i think ooh, there maybe mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. And uh, there's a, uh, uh, there were more requests in the chat for you to um, show in a little bit more detail how the motion vectors were applied for that transition uh, from India okay, to Bali. Okay, sure. Okay, so... Um... So, yeah, see, this is why I didn't use the motion vectors in the VFX. Um, actually, you no, know, let's go to this one in the VFX uh, breakdown because it's quite, it's quite hard to visually show it. That's the problem. But, um, yeah, so basically, you've got barley, right? This is barley here, um, where it's moving normally right towards the end, You're moving normally like that. So, this is my source clip, and then it stops moving. This is the point where we go through the door. I stopped it moving there, or it's moving very, very slowly. Um, and this is what's generating the motion vectors, right? So I mean, I'm um, sorry, could, could you just, uh, on the schematic, just zoom into the nodes a little bit closer? Yeah, 
cool. So this is what's so India. Uh, Bali's here, right? This is the background. Bali's there, and it's hardly moving, and then speeding up. And India's here, and it's moving fast, and then slowing down. So the you know, I should be looking at moving fast, and then slowing down. And so there's like a handoff from one to the other. And so in the motion vectors, I've cached all of that whole area. So this, what we're looking at here is what would be the door would be in this area here. Um, and so towards the end from here, we've got the, let me look at, so. Yeah, this is the output, right? So you can see this is this is the drone actually moving. And then as we come backwards, the barley clip is slowing down, but the mo but the in the motion from the India clip is driving the movement of here. So it's warping. So you can see I mean, actually I'll tell you what, probably the best thing to do is if I make this fifty percent transparent. Um so yeah. I need to put India in the background. Oops, <laughs> that's not good. Um, I think that's not going to screw me up. So now, you can see I don't know whether that really shows it, but you can see that, <laughs> yeah, you can see that that building there is now warping the barley clip. Yep. Yeah. If you look, especially at the rooftop of that building, you can see how. Yeah. Uh, how it's so, it. so, yeah, that whole, um, everything, yep. everything in that barley clip is now being warped by. Let me transition now India. to um, the the clip you sent me, the doors open clip. Yeah. Because uh, you can really see here that happen if you look uh at the at the uh the green you know fields in the bali shot you can now you can really see them being kind of pushed by the uh the motion of the rooftop of that building in india mm. so cool yeah and it and it and it just sort of slips from using as as one as the india clip is slowing down the bali clip speeding up and it just hands off from one to the other mm -hmm. um uh, hopefully seamlessly. I, I can see a, I can see a, a bit of a. You, you can see that what the, the problem is you can see that the um, parallax isn't changing in the barley chip in the barley clip. The perspective is changing, but the parallax between the elements isn't changing, and then mm -hmm. it starts changing. But that's as good as you can get, basically, or I could get. <clears throat> it's great, though, man. Fantastic. Mm. Well done. Mm. One more round of really applause. <laughs> well, that's great uh rufus i want to thank you for coming on today and for taking us through uh this amazing piece i'm going to leave the chat open if anybody has any more questions go ahead and throw them in there but uh i'm just going to transition over to give away a couple of prizes so just stand by cool do this. Okay, pleasure. oh i gotta move the window wait a minute this is injustice oh wait a minute here we go Greg Paul, you seeing this? This is almost this is almost as impressive as what Richard showed. I'm sorry, as what Rufus showed with uh, using motion vectors to align things. As I align this wheel with the circle of my face, don't you agree? <laughs> All right, uh, I've got a couple of things to give away here today. Uh, the first thing we're going to give away is one of those Logic hoodies, the Zip Up hoodie. Look your best. Uh, I'm just going to shuffle the names up and then spin the wheel. Oh, there we go. It's coming around. And uh, who do we have? Enrique, congratulations. Nice. All right, next up will be your choice of a Logic hat. Who's that going to? Barry, congratulations, Barry. Nice. And the third thing today is uh, we're going to give away, a, a, I got a Logic water bottle to give away, which can also be used for a hot beverage on a cold day.
Alexandre, congratulations. All right. Love it. Let's go back. Again, Rufus, thank you very much. If you want to uh, uh, head on over to the uh, the patron check, go right ahead. We'll meet you there uh, once I wrap everything cool. up. But thanks, okay. man. This thank was absolutely amazing. And the uh, the chat, everybody loved it. Great cool. job, man. I really enjoyed it too. Cool. Okay, thanks so much. Wonderful. All right. Let's see what's coming up on Logic Live in the future, my friends. Next Sunday, January 30th, marks the return of Brian Bailey to Logic Live. Looking forward to that. On Sunday, February 6th, Adam Taylor is going to join us to uh, take us through his One Frame of White entry. And then on February 13th, David Kreitz is going to come on and take us through uh, one of his uh, installation projects. Uh, I just want to give a shout out. Uh, our friend Barry is going to be he's producing and hosting um, a virtual uh, a, a webinar on um, in, in conjunction with uh, Simti Hollywood and the Visual Effects Society on machine learning in visual effects. Uh, the registration link for this, I'm going to paste in the chat. It's in the YouTube description. Um, so you can grab it there. Whoops, hold on. Let me just grab that and paste it in. This is going to be on Wednesday, the 26th at uh, 12 p.m. If I'm correct, hold on. Oh, I'm having a problem here. I can do all these amazing things. Greg Paul, I can't copy and paste a link. I wonder why I can't copy and paste this link. Oh, well. Um, I will make sure you can grab it in the uh, in the description, the YouTube description. But try to tune in. Our friend Will Harris is going to be on. And uh, thank you very much, Barry, for sharing this, sharing this with the community. Next up is, uh, if you are not a member of the Logic Forum, please go ahead and sign up at forum.logic.tv. And join the conversation on Discord. This episode of Logic Live, like all others, will be available on Logic.tv later today. And definitely check out uh, this new episode of the Logic Podcast. It was released this past week. It uh, was an interview that I did with our friend Brooks Tomlinson. I want to thank Brooks. Also want to give a shout out to uh, Glenn Teal uh, on the forum. Glenn had reached out to me over the uh, holiday break and said he'd love to, you know, he loves the podcast and would love to hear more. Is there anything I could do to help? And Glenn has been helping me with editing these. I record them, send them to Glenn. He does all the uh, post-production work on them, and we get them posted. So we're going to be having Logic podcast episodes um, on a much more regular basis. We're trying for every other week, and thank you very much, Glenn, for your help with that. If you haven't already uh, liked and subscribed on the uh, uh, YouTube channel, please smash that like button, as Randy likes to tell us to do. There's Randy. Hey, brother. And want to thank all of our patrons on Patreon.com. If you'd like to become a patron of Logic, you can do it at Patreon.com slash Logic TV. Be sure to hit up the merch store for all of your Logic goodness. And if you're in need of tech support or an upgrade, call Jack Horrocks, jack at flametech.com.au for flame networking, storage, and custom builds. And if you'd like to save some money on your Boris FX plugins, you can save 15% on any Boris FX product, standalone or subscription, when you use the code LOGIC-15 at checkout. And I uh, want to thank AJA and Cinesis for their support of Logic Live and the Logic community. That is going to do it for us, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rufus. And we will see you all next time. Have a great week, everybody. Stay warm out there.